Thanks to James and to the other organizers. It's great to be here. This is the first time that I've participated in this meeting, and I anticipate I'll be a regular participant from now on. Um, we are absolute uh, hardcore believers in exactly the sorts of things that James just mentioned, that the field, particularly the field that I'm in, which is non-coding RNA therapeutics, desperately needs better delivery mechanisms, and we're, we're relying on the field. We're heavy users of the technologies that are coming out of the field uh, to, to try and enable some of, uh, some of our ideas to make it into the clinic. So today, I'm going to tell you sort of more of, of, a, of an overview, of an introduction to uh, non-coding RNA. So even though my title was Microrna-based Therapeutics in Cancer, um, how do I do this, actually? Do I? Uh, OK, there we go. Um, I'm going to give you just a, just a broad overview of non-coding RNA, since microRNAs are just one part of the, of the uh, spectrum of non-coding RNAs. Um, and then hopefully give you a sense of what we're trying to do at the Institute for RNA Medicine, now called the Harvard Medical School Initiative for RNA Medicine. And, um, and then lastly, end with our uh, new endeavor, which is a core facility that we've opened at Harvard Medical School that will, in fact, include many of the equipment uh, and uh, machines that you see in the back room, uh, which will enable hopefully anybody in the Boston area, anybody in the Massachusetts area or Northeast area to come and um, uh, try and uh, use these new technologies to enhance their own drug delivery. So if I can have the next slide, I guess I'd, I'd do that. Uh, so it's, a, it, it's, it's not a surprise to this audience, um, and I'm not going to belabor this point, that it's been a really exciting time for non-coding RNAs. Certainly the last two decades or so, we've realized that our genomes encode much more than just protein-coding genes. And in fact, uh, some of you in the audience will remember the surprise we all had when the human genome sequence came out and we realized we only had 20,000 protein coding genes. I think the new number is down to like 17,000 when the annotations have been made. That's about the same number of protein coding genes as C. elegans has, as fruit flies. So we can't really rely on the protein coding genes to explain our complexity. But in the same time, we've, we've recognized that our genomes encode many more types of RNAs. And the number of non-coding RNAs seems to increase uh, in com um, as complexity in evolution increases as well. So maybe that's where the answers lie. And we believe that not only um, are these, are these um, non-coding RNAs uh, providing us with, with a new paradigm for gene regulation, but they also provide a lot of opportunity um, for, uh, uh, for sort of as a new paradigm for diagnostics and therapeutics. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about, about uh, why we think that um, uh, is possible in the next few slides. Yes, the Human Genome Sequencing Project was instrumental in changing the, our, our views uh, into, into our complexity. Uh, and, and to be honest, it is, it is an amazingly complex situation that we find ourselves in. However, with complexity, I believe, comes opportunity. So it's our goal as, uh, as a community um, that's interested in making a difference in the, uh, the lives of patients to learn as much as we can about these new molecules, both as biomarkers uh, for disease, but also as potential targets for, uh, for new therapeutics. So the ENCODE project published a few years back that it appeared that much of our genome was, in fact, transcribed. So there were many, many more RNA-type genes that were being made from, from our genome than, uh, sorry, many more RNA uh, uh, encoding genes that were in our genome, but, many, uh, but only a few of them we now know code for proteins. So, uh, so we now know that the human genome makes upwards of um, about 5,000 small non-coding RNAs of the class known as microRNAs. I'll tell you a little bit more about microRNAs um, as we go along. And this number should be taken not a, Literally, but but uh, but uh, um, uh, these numbers are, are changing every single time the database gets updated. So please don't flame me with uh, with emails saying that I don't have the exact number uh, or the correct number on the slide. I just want to give you the sense that we have thousands of these types of RNAs uh, that are being made in our cells. We now know that um, we probably make upwards of 
30 to 40, maybe 50,000 long known coding RNAs. These are RNAs that are uh, at least 200 nucleotides in length, probably, um, probably an arbitrary number, and so this number is probably likely to increase as we recognize that there are many other classes of RNAs that maybe don't fit these exact uh, criteria. So all of those pseudogenes that you learned about in um, high school and college biology, they're being repurposed or rethought of now as, as actually having functions, and we thought that they, that they didn't do anything because they didn't have a start code on in the RNA, but if the RNA is made, that RNA has some, some kind of a function. If that function um, potentially competes with, the, with uh, the binding factors that are binding to, uh, to its sort of cousin gene that, that, that it's related to, then, then these RNAs are now um, functional. And then very recently we've realized that our genomes transcribe or, or, or process RNAs in, a, in an unusual way, and that many of the linear RNAs that we are um, familiar with in our cells get processed through a different mechanism to form circular RNAs as well. And the latest indications are that there might be 100,000 or more of these circular RNAs within our cells, um, opening up a whole new field of, of, of biology for, for us, not only for new biomarkers, but also just to potentially understand the biology of this and, and maybe uh, to try and uh, prove that some of these are functional and could be functional targets for, for new therapies as well. Right, so I'm going to spend most of my time talking about non-coding RNAs as therapeutics. Um, however, it's, it, it is my belief that, that given the, uh, the sort of natural trajectory of, of, um, of science and the, and the inertia that, or the, the, the slowness that, it, uh, that we now see in, in um, designing or um, getting drugs approved, that these non-coding RNAs are most likely to make an impact in the clinic as diagnostics or prognostic markers. And in fact, there are uh, already tests that physicians can prescribe to their patients for um, uh, uh, using non-coding RNAs as, for example, uh, markers of certain kinds of diseases. But it is um, still a goal, or I, think, I think an important goal of the field, to try and develop these biomarkers, if you will, in, into functional biomarkers and into uh, new targets of, of therapy. So the field has um, seen some successes already uh, uh, using non-coding RNAs as therapeutics. The first one uh, that's, that's probably most familiar to people um, is the fact that there is a microRNA that is important for HCV replication, and you can target this microRNA as a potential therapy for hepatitis C. This uh, particular um, non-coding RNA therapeutic uh, made it all the way into phase three trials and um, is being pursued by two companies, Roche and um, Regulus, as a potential therapeutic for, for HCV. So that was one of the first successes. There have been a number of failures as well. I'm not going to dwell on what those failures are, but, um, but these kinds of, of uh, technologies are still really new, and we're still in the, I would say, we're still in the, um, the optimization and humanization phase of this work, and so it's not surprising that, that we still have a lot to learn. Okay, so opportunities now for novel therapeutics are numerous. There's the opportunity to use this RNA as a drug. So if you have an RNA that's, um, uh, that's lost in a particular disease, I'm going to use the example here of a tumor suppressor microRNA that might be lost in, in cancer. One is the opportunity to, uh, to deliver the RNA itself as, as the drug. Now, there's a lot of interest in delivering RNAs. Certainly in the Boston area, Moderna has had, uh, you know, that's the modus operandi, trying, trying to deliver messenger RNAs, deliver, um, well, now they've turned to, uh, they're focused on delivering other kinds of RNAs as well. Um, my lab is focused mainly on trying to deliver microRNAs as a, as a potential um, uh, therapeutic. So the second case is that, is that the RNA itself can be drugged. It can be the drug target. The example I'll give is if a, if a non-coding RNA is upregulated or amplified in a disease, um, like, for example, is oncogenic in cancer, one can try and 
uh, deliver agents that would knock out the activity or the expression of that particular non-coding RNA. And then lastly, you can think about ways to, to try and drug the biogenesis of these um, offending RNAs. So uh, in the case of microRNAs, there are enzymes that process these, uh, these small RNAs from larger precursors, and each of those enzymes is potentially a drug target for, for a particular disease. Non-coding RNAs, we don't, uh, are, of the, of the non-microRNA class, um, we don't understand as much about how their biogenesis um, uh, is, is performed, but you can imagine that these, these sort of uh, roots are gonna, be, um, uh, are gonna be druggable in the future. A very exciting new class of, of enzymes that I think are gonna be making their way into the clinic, hopefully in the next decade or so, are uh, drugs that target the enzymes that modify RNA. So this new field of uh, uh, epitranscriptomics is really making its, its mark. Uh, we now recognize that not only is DNA modified by, by all these enzymes and uh, gets methylated and acetylated, uh, or oh, sorry, so it gets methylated and um, uh, gets modified, but RNAs get modified extensively as well. And so these enzymes are gonna be um, interesting drug targets in the future. All right, so let me just tell you a few things about microRNAs and cancer, since that's what we focused on for the most part in my lab. I should just say that we focused on microRNAs mainly because they were one of the first classes of non-coding RNAs that have really sort of led the charge in, in, in our understanding of the power and the potential uh, and the use of non-coding RNAs in disease. Um, but we think that what we've learned for non-coding RNAs will probably be true for other classes of RNAs as well. I'll show you in a, in a, in a few slides that these non other non-coding RNAs are sort of bringing up the rear quite quickly uh, in, in, uh, in potential. Um, and then the second point I wanna make is that we've focused on cancer mainly because that's where some of the first um, phenotypes were seen for non-coding RNAs um, and, uh, and also where some of the initial breakthroughs have been, have been made, largely because of the fact that there are cell-based and uh, animal-based models for cancer that, that are amenable to the study. But once again, um, this is just an example of, of, of the potential use of these RNAs. So we know that microRNAs are frequently uh, located in genomic regions uh, that are lost or amplified in cancer, so these are sort of fragile sites. Um, it's, it's, uh, um, it's not uncommon um, to, to find a non-coding RNA in a region that, that um, a cancer geneticist might um, recognize as being at, a, at sort of a break point of, 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 of a translocation or in an amplified region or in a, in a region that's epigenetically modified in cancer. Uh, we know that um, in almost every case, if you compare tumors to normal adjacent tissue, there are clear cases of uh, microRNA dysregulation between the tumors and, and the normal tissue. And this has led to uh, the, um, uh, the idea that we might be able to use microRNAs as markers for particular uh, 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 diseases or particular um, uh, sort of prognostic, uh, to, to sort of measure prognosis as well. Uh, just recently, uh, it's been recognized that there are mutations within the non-coding RNA, uh, between the microRNA, microRNA processing machinery genes. Dicer and Drosha are frequently uh, mutated in cancer. Most recently, uh, uh, a very exciting finding that there are patients with childhood cancers that inherit a bad copy of Dicer 1, for example, and then get a second mutation in the normal copy of Dicer 1, which leads to, uh, to these childhood cancers. Um, we now know that microRNAs can be oncogenes and tumor suppressors, and they regulate oncogenes and tumor suppressors. Um, so um, we now know that, that, uh, that these non-coding RNAs have been shown, in, at least in preclinical models, to be uh, targeted therapeutics or uh, um, therapeutic targets. And then lastly, it's not going to be the focus of my talk, these non-coding RNAs, like these microRNAs, are frequently found in... Um, uh, bodily fluids and, and, and can be really useful non-invasive biomarkers uh, for a variety of different diseases. So this has led to this quite remarkable trajectory where the first microRNA was, was discovered only in 1993 and yet just, just under 20 years later the first 
microRNA-based therapeutics into clinical trials. 2011, uh, the antisense to, to the microRNA that's, uh, that's required for hepatitis C replication uh, into clinical trials, and in 2013, a microRNA mimic for, uh, for MIR-34 into, into clinical trials. So a few years ago, we wrote a review. This was back, I think, 2011, where we, we, we tried to um, review the state of the field and, and, and how preclinical studies were, were really um, suggesting that there was going to be an explosion of clinical work in, in this particular area. And then just this year, we were able to update the field and, and, and talk about all of the examples of microRNA therapeutics that have actually made it into the clinic. I think we discussed 10 different clinical trials in this, in this particular review, and I suggest if, you, if you're interested in learning more, please, please go ahead and, and, um, and read that paper. So one metric that I like to keep track of is every few months I go to clinicaltrials.gov and just ask how many clinical trials are there if you, if you, if you just use the keyword microRNA, and this number is, is continually increasing. So just, I think, a few weeks ago, I did the search, and maybe, um, I can't really, uh, yeah, there we go. So maybe four, about 450 studies, 450 clinical trials uh, in, this, in this database are using microRNAs in some um, aspect. Now, most of them are using microRNAs as diagnostics. So here's one to evaluate whether microRNAs can be, can be of any diagnostic value for inflammatory bowel disease. But there are other ones where, for example, they're looking at the therapeutic potential of microRNAs as well. Now, I mentioned that microRNAs have maybe sort of led the charge, and, and this, is, uh, this is easy to see when you just do the same kind of search, but for long known coding RNAs. And you'll see that there are maybe one tenth the number of trials um, in long known coding RNAs. Uh, but, but equally interesting, so here's some looking for, uh, uh, for long known coding RNAs as diagnostics for um, triple negative breast cancer. And I imagine that this list is. Uh, is going to increase in time as well. And then lastly, if you just look for circular RNAs, these are the most recently described class of non-coding RNAs. There's only one study. Um, and, and I'm, once again, going to probably bet that, that this number is going to be increasing dramatically over the next few years. So just a few examples from my own group. I'm not going to be spending much time talking about um, hardcore data. Just to, just to tell you that we are interested in both of those, or in, in, in all three of those therapeutic applications that I mentioned earlier. We want to target um, miscreant RNAs, RNAs that are, that are, that are causal in, in disease. We want to deliver RNAs to, uh, uh, to disease tissues where those RNAs are missing. And we're also interested in targeting the biogenesis machinery with, uh, with small molecules and other kinds of drugs. So this is just an example where uh, we built a mass model that, that overexpresses a microRNA, in this case, MIR-155, which is known to be overexpressed in human lymphomas and leukemias. And this mouse, in fact, gets lymphoma. You can see an enlarged lymph node um, growing out, out of the side of this animal's neck, this axillary lymph node. If we target this particular RNA with an antisense molecule, uh, we can actually um, not only deliver the RNA, uh, this antisense to the tumors, but we can actually cure this particular mouse. <clears throat> so um, I mentioned earlier that we are firm believers that better delivery and better targeting of these kinds of agents is the key to success in this field. Uh, and um, I would also say that some of the initial failures of the trials in this field have really come down to poor delivery and um, uh, the fact that most of the patients are getting such high doses of these kinds of drugs that, that they're inducing immune responses that, that were not anticipated. So being able to target these kinds of drugs at, at fairly low levels, this was, this was targeted at, I think, one meg per kg um, is, is the sort of dose that I think uh, would, would, would hopefully help in um, avoiding some of those immune responses that patients are mounting against RNA. Um, so I'm just going to show you two quick movies. This is that same mouse that I told you has uh, lymphoma, you're not going to see the lymph nodes. At this point in the, in the, in the disease, the B cells have metastasized from, from, those, from those lymph nodes throughout the body into the spinal cord, into the brain. If you start this movie, you'll see that this mouse is severely paralyzed. Um, it's actually on death's door. We were told to sacrifice it for humane reasons or to use it acutely. We inject it into the tail vein, 
and antisense to that micro-NA 155. And if you start this movie over here, you'll see that in just a few days that mouse was completely cured. Um, so not to give you the sense that we've cured lymphoma. Um, many of you who've worked on mouse models know that it's not that difficult, or it's not as difficult to cure cancer in a mouse as it is to cure cancer in a human. Um, we know exactly what caused the cancer in this mouse. It is overexpression of a single non-coding RNA gene, in this case a microRNA. And if you target that microRNA, you can, you can cure this mouse. However, it does, um, I believe, give a good proof of principle that these kinds of studies might be useful in human clinical work as well. And um, I was gratified to see just um, last year that uh, a clinical trial targeting MIR-155 for a different kind of lymphoma, in this case cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, uh, was initiated uh, uh, by Mirogen Therapeutics, and it's my hope that these types of clinical trials will show success and that we'll be able to see more of these tri uh, trials in the future. Okay, and the next example that I'll talk about is a case where a microRNA might be absent, missing, deleted, uh, epigenetically downregulated in a, in, a, in a disease. In this case, in lung cancer, we know that um, uh, in, in, for example, KRAS-P53 double mutant lung cancer, MIR-34, one of the tumor suppressor microRNAs that I mentioned earlier, is um, dramatically downregulated. Um, what we noticed was that if you, if you deliver MIR-34 to the mouse model, uh, uh, this KRAS-P53 double mutant mouse model, you could completely prevent lung tumors from forming in this mouse. And we've done some additional studies showing that systemic delivery of MIR-34 in a, in a sort of more so the sorts of studies that we uh, have, have been trying to perform to encourage more clinical applications for these, for these new um, types of drug targets and targets. So for the remainder of my talk, I'll tell you just a little bit about what we're trying to do at the Harvard Medical School Initiative for RNA Medicine. Um, the vision that we have, the mission that we have at this initiative is really to, to, to take these new discoveries in RNA and uh, generate new diagnostics and therapeutics and get them into the clinic to help patients. But we want to do that by stimulating outstanding basic translational and clinical research with the world's leading scientists in this area. And for me, that doesn't necessarily mean they have to be in academia. So one of the, one of the um, um, objectives that we have is to try and stimulate um, academia, and industry collaborations as well. I'll talk to you a little bit about that in a minute. So the idea is to take basic science, and, and I'm showing this as a, as a larger balloon because really the field is sitting right here. We know a lot about, we know more about the, uh, about the number of RNAs there are uh, than, than about what they do, and we know um, less about which ones are in fact involved in different diseases, and we know the least about um, getting these into the clinic. But the idea is to try and push this innovation funnel, if you will, um, more towards the right-hand side of the slide. So we have um, a three-pronged approach towards combating disease. We want more discovery, but we want to um, actually get these types of discoveries into the clinic. So I, I can see now that I'm, that I'm running out of time. So I'm going to um, skip over these, uh, these particular um, slides and just tell you a little bit about our strategy. So basically, we, we, we really want to accelerate these discoveries. Uh, we want to capitalize on the collective expertise uh, that's here in the Boston area. This is ground zero for, um, for RNA top research. We want to stimulate a cultural exchange with RNA biotechnology um, companies in Boston and, and, and the academics in Boston. Um, our major goal is to, is to actually um, advance clinical applications for some of these RNAs. And then I'm, I've saved this one for last because we really want to um, build common core facilities that will enable uh, neophytes or, or, or people that are interested in this particular field but don't know really how to get started to, to try and uh, um, get, get going in the field and, um, and uh, get their discoveries into the clinic. So I'm going to just spend a f one last minute telling you a little bit about a core facility that we've started um, that, that we hope will be useful for the community. So we've called this the Non-Coding RNA Precision Diagnostics and Therapeutics Core. It's, it's part of the Harvard Medical School Initiative of RNA Medicine. It's hosted at BIDMC. And the idea is that we, have a f we will have, 
once it gets going in full, um, a non-coding RNA concierge service. So we're going to have abilities for scientists to, d to detect RNA, to figure out which of those are functional in their, in their disease, and lastly, to um, apply this to new therapeutics. So we're going to um, have state-of-the-art detection methods for quantification and discovery of non-coding RNAs uh, from clinical samples. Uh, we're going to be um, uh, have specialized bioinformatics that helps uh, our researchers make sense of the data. We think there's so much data out there that actually the, the critical part is trying to make sense of it all. And then lastly, we're going to be uh, hopefully uh, having in the core some of the state-of-the-art uh, machinery and equipment that would allow scientists to, uh, to generate delivery uh, uh, capabilities to get those particular RNAs into, into tissues. So we're situated um, in, um, in, a, in a pretty large space in the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center Hospital in the, in the Department of Pathology. The space is uh, in the hospital, which allows uh, scientists, if they're going to be generating these new kinds of drugs, to do either co-clinical or clinical uh, work. In fact, they could walk the, uh, it's going to be a GMP facility. They can walk these kinds of drugs into, into the clinic if they wish. And we're very excited to, uh, to say that we're going to be um, uh, uh, the site of, of a GMP nano delivery um, core, uh, and, and, uh, and we, we will hopefully, uh, in the very near future, be the only facility in the Boston area, the only academic facility, that will have the nano assembler, Spark, Benchtop, and Blaze for all of you and, and, and your uh, colleagues to, uh, to come and try out your new ideas. And so we'd like to thank Precision Nano Systems for working with us to, uh, to set up this core. And we're hopeful that, uh, that we'll be active in the next uh, few months. And if you have interest in, in, uh, in finding out more, please send me an email. At the moment, we don't have a website up yet, but very soon we will. And we, and we look forward to working with you um, on, your, on your ideas. So with that, I'm just going to thank the people in my lab, thank my collaborators, and uh, my former students, and uh, the funding agencies for funding us, and you for your attention. Thank you. Great. And uh, we probably have time for one question. Does anyone have a specific question? If not, I have a burning question. Yes, Dan Pierre has a question. with the microRNAs that you don't really know exactly all their potential targets. Don't you afraid a little bit from adverse effects? Oh, uh, absolutely. So, um, yeah, so, so Dan is bringing up a good point. We have this uncertainty as to exactly what the, what the, uh, the consequences might be of delivering a microRNA. Um, one thing that I, that I tend, one sort of hand-waving argument that I, that I tend to use is that these are natural products. In, in the case of some of these microRNAs, they've been in, on this planet for b a billion years. So uh, cells have sort of figured out the, the off-targeting, if you will, of these kinds of molecules. Now, whether there are um, unintended uh, targets, that's, that's certainly um, a concern. My feeling is that uh, that sort of can be, can be hopefully um, overcome with the right dosing and uh, it's it's something that we're we're very interested in, in determining is what are the what are the sort of therapeutic windows where you get a therapeutic effect but very low side effects. I mean, I think a bigger concern for me right now is um, is the fact that it's, it appears that the that the immune system can recognize these double stranded RNAs even even the small ones in ways that we didn't quite anticipate a few years ago. 